On the verge of victory number 200, the team about to win 12 of the next 16 championships in the all-black Southwest Athletic Conference, Robinson has a future Hall of Famer at wide receiver, Charlie Joyner, and at quarterback, another sporting pioneer to be, James Harris. Eddie goes to Monroe, Louisiana, to scout a high school game. He said, Dar, Stars, look at that long, tall boy. Looks like a stork. He's going to be my quarterback one day. He can't do anything right now, but he's going to be my quarterback. Growing up in Monroe, Louisiana, James Harris had never played football with a white person and had hardly exchanged words with one. We had our own community, and we were separated. And, you know, you lived that way, and that's what you knew during during that time, you know, and you certainly question that, you know, on Sundays when you go to church. And, you know, everybody's supposed to be praying to the same God, but yet, you know, once you leave during the week, life is totally different. We were playing more than for the conference championship and to win games. You know, we were playing for dear old grandma. We were representing something. And when you went out and played and you lost, you felt that you were letting the school down and you felt you were letting him down. One particular day, we were playing all corn, and Coach had been running the same plays for so long, they knew to play, and they called it by name, 126 counter. I said, Coach, they know to play. They called him to play. He said, oh, yeah, what they call? I said, 126 counter. Coach said, oh, yeah? And he'd always grab you when he sent you in the game while he's talking to you. And he sent him in the game. I said, what's the play? He said, 126 counter. So I go in reluctantly. Didn't want to call 126 counter. And actually Johnson goes 62 yards for a touchdown. So when I come out the game, he says, blocking and tackling. He is going to touchdown, Grambling. And I didn't want to play quarterback originally because I knew uh, I had no chance of playing in the NFL. It was understood, but if you wanted any chance to play in the NFL, you needed to switch position. I got a phone call from Eddie Robinson saying, how do I get that book on quarterback? Within a week, Eddie could recite everything in the book. You're going to have to make the article. You're gonna have he would always bring back pieces of paper, napkins, about notes he'd taken from different people. So he was preparing me for that small wonder in case I got the chance. I had the ability to play, and I was listening at this speech, Martin Luther King's speech, about the content of your character. And one day, the opportunities we may have is probably mentally when I really decided that I was not going to switch position. In 1968 was a year that was worth a decade. You know, you had Martin Luther King assassinated in April. Uh, you had Bobby Kennedy assassinated in June. You had the Democratic National Convention. I know you can play quarterback in the NFL. The, the decision, decision is yours. yours. But if you don't go, if, if guys, guys like, like you don't go, it's going to be that much more difficult for the next guy. Eddie Robinson to James Harris, 1969. When I went to Tampa in 1978, it was tough. But, you know, I think about James Harris in Buffalo in 1968. It's, you know, dealing with whites at the time and going to be a leader of a team, you understood the reason other blacks wasn't making it because they said they couldn't lead and they wasn't smart enough. So those are the challenges that you had. But I, little did I know that I wasn't alone because coach would call me every night. Robinson's mission to make Harris the first black quarterback to ever start a season was a success, but not without cost. Selected in the eighth round by the Buffalo Bills, Harris was welcomed to the league by death threats, police harassment. But he'd survive and thrive in 12 NFL seasons, play twice for the NFC title, pave the way. Shaq was going to be the first black quarterback to really make it big, because he had all the tools. He was six foot four, he was 235 pounds, had a cannon of an arm, what he calls one of these, ooh, 
we aren't, you know. Well, I'm real happy and honored. I just hope I can do good. He was drafted in the eighth round by Buffalo, a place that looked nothing like home, yet carried many of its prejudices. First group of fan mail that I got, and I hadn't even had the opportunity to show my wares yet, and reading this hate mail and reading several, uh, several of them, just one out there and the other, and they kept coming in. I think that was a low moment, and certainly some of the death threats, you know, that you receive, you know, were kind of low moments. After stepping away from the NFL for a year, a more resilient Harris was given new life in Los Angeles. And the thing that he always told me, he never got into how tough it was for him in Buffalo or anywhere else as much as if you can throw the football in Grambling and, and anywhere else you play, you can do it in the National Football League because the field dimension didn't never change. And it was always positive. And uh, I got a lot of respect for that because I didn't come into the National Football League with a negative mentality because I had a guy like James Harris. And it was Marlon, because of the scars that he had suffered in Denver, who was able to, to, to shepherd Shaq along and kind of give him that reinforcement. Uh, ironically, the next year I was James Harris's uh, roommate at uh, Buffalo, where I had to make the transition from quarterback to receiver. And I know firsthand, uh, I have firsthand knowledge uh, of those death threats to James. Traditionally, the quarterback position was for whites only until the Bills drafted James Harris. From the start, Harris knew he wouldn't be judged by the same standards as other quarterbacks and would have to be better than the best. Going to Buffalo, I noticed that all of, there were black running backs, bunches and bunches. There were wide receivers, as many as you can count, and defensive backs, all you want, but black quarterbacks, zero. I'd be nervous. Either way, whether I was starting or just dressing and coming out to play. Well, I'm real happy and honored. I just hope I can do good. Harris did so well that he earned the starting assignment by beating out the People's Choice veteran Jack Kemp. I'm not bragging about it, but I had a very strong arm. <laughs> Sounds braggadocious, but I, I had a, a, and he had a stronger arm than I had. He was certainly the first black quarterback in Buffalo. It was not an issue with me, but it was, you know, to be honest, it was, it was new. New problems emerged for Harris, who performed well, but had difficulty communicating with his teammates. I do remember where I was in the play call in the huddle and everything went smoothly and I got sacked. After I got up and dusted myself off and got to the sideline, the coach told me that the players said that they didn't understand my diction. They had to keep Minnie Max Anderson on the team because he was the only one that could interpret what James Harris would say in the huddle. I wasn't gonna let the snap count get me cut, so I called every snap count on one. So Max shouldn't have any problem understanding on one. <laughs> Harris dealt with the quarterback pressures, but they were magnified by the color of his skin. It was tough trying to play perfect every week and then having to keep winning the job over and over again. Those were kind of tough conditions to, to continue to play or not. Three losing seasons and a coaching change prompted Harris's departure from Buffalo and put his future in doubt. How could you not think it was over when there were no blacks playing quarterback? Harris got another chance to prove himself with the Los Angeles Rams. Despite leading L.A. to three straight NFC Championship games, Harris was still subjected to bigotry and hatred. I was his roommate, and uh, he would always bring some mail in, and always uh, intermixed with some of that positive fan mail was probably some of the nastiest fan mail you'd ever want to see. I mean, I couldn't believe people would actually sit down with a pen and address, you know, uh, letters, you know, racial comments, derogatory comments. It was part of the times that we were living in. During that time, wasn't any blacks playing quarterback, and there were some people that didn't think that I was capable or should be playing. Harris persevered, 
and his career paved the way for future black quarterbacks, proving that talent is more important than color. And now it's like no one even noticed that blacks ever uh, didn't play that position because they are getting the opportunity to do it. I would love to play now, but somebody had to play then. I feel very fortunate that it was me, and I can only hope, you know, that my play, you know, may have influenced some young person to set their goals high and think that they could realistically play quarterback in the NFL. Now, black quarterbacks are commonplace in the NFL, each living the legacy of James Harris. These players got their chance because of a man who was quietly competitive, quietly confident. A man who quietly made history in 1969.